Good morning, everybody. It's Saturday, and it's Russ Barkley back again with your weekly research update and another episode of Boomers Wearing Flannel. Hey, got another dad joke for you. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl in the bathroom? Wait, wait, wait for it. Because the P is silent. Oh, that's so good. I love that joke. All right, let's continue with this morning's research roundup. Uh, for those of you who are new to my weekly research updates, I put all of the research that was published this week over in the thumbnail sketch associated with this video. Then I select those I think are noteworthy and give some brief comments about each of those papers. For those papers I discuss in the video, I also give you the link over to the journal article if you wish to pursue it. Keep in mind, I do not review research on animals, and I also do not review research in dissertations or master's theses that may have been published on the internet, but none of which has undergone, as yet, peer review for journal publication. So we stick just with peer-reviewed articles. Okay, so first up this week is this article that you see here. Let me just widen my screen. Uh, on the long-term cardiovascular risks that may be associated with stimulant treatment for attention deficit disorder. This is, of course, a, a rather hot button or controversial area because from time to time I hear uh, lay people and the mainstream media talking about um, whether there's a risk for a heart attack or stroke in people who take stimulant medication over a long term. Uh, and of course, we've had articles on this going all the way back for the last 40 years. But lately, we've seen a number of research papers that are large databases, and so we do need to pay attention to those. So here is a study that was published in the European Heart Journal. It comes from Denmark, uh, and it uses the country's large-scale database of their health records to take a look at the possible cardiovascular risks that are associated with treatment with uh, stimulant medication. Uh, and in this review, it also included atomoxetine, although that's not necessarily a stimulant. Uh, it is associated with what is called um, management of sympathomimetic amines, types of neurochemicals in the brain. So they're looking specifically for any increase in heart failure, uh, in stroke, and in what is called acute coronary syndrome. So they're going to use this country's database, and they identified 27,724 people uh, that had been started on medication, and they then divided them into those who stopped medication, those who were on a low dose of medication, and those who were on a higher dose of medication. And they compared the three groups for their risk of these cardiac problems over the next 10 years, so known as a 10-year absolute risk ratio here that they're calculating. What they found is that the high-dose group, compared to both the discontinuation and the low-dose group, did have a slightly higher risk of heart attack, that is, of sudden cardiac arrest, and of stroke. Uh, the risks were increased by about 30% over what we would see in the typical population. Uh, so that may sound large to you, but remember, we're, it's not that you have a 30% chance of these happening, it's that your risk increases 30% over the baseline. So one thing I want you to keep in mind here then is, what was the baseline? Well, the baseline for heart attack and stroke in a population of this young age, keep in mind that these people were 23 to 41 years of age, is very, very low. And so, for instance, if, let's say, uh, out of thin air, six people in the general population carried a risk for these problems, then a third of that would be eight people treated with high-dose medication would have an elevated risk. So uh, again, an increase of just two people in the population. Nothing that you would get excited about, even though that's a 30% rise in the risk ratio. So we need to pay attention to absolute numbers when we look at relative risk, because if the absolute numbers are very low, it doesn't take many new cases of that event to raise the risk ratio. And that's probably what is happening 
in a study like this. Also keep in mind, because the study uses such a large sample of people, even slight changes in risk ratios can become statistically significant, even though clinically they're not all that interesting. So I don't want to minimize the findings completely here because there might be some signal here that over 10 years there is a little bit of elevated risk of heart attack and stroke in people taking these medications. But let's remember this is one country, not a representative sample of the world, though it's a very large study. The second thing to keep in mind is there's a possible confounding factor here that the authors don't mention in the abstract for this article, and that is severity of ADHD. It's very likely that people with ADHD who discontinued treatment were milder cases who weren't seeing much benefit from medication or in some other way were different from the rest of the group. People with a low dose of medication may have had somewhat more ADHD, and people on the highest dose of medication may have had more severe ADHD. So there's no effort in this study to control for severity of ADHD that might be associated with higher doses of medication. Makes perfect sense that there would be such an association. Uh, so until that gets corrected for in a study like this, I'm not going to take this study to the bank and say, oh, definitively, there's an elevated risk for these two cardiac outcomes, because we just don't know that. It's a very unusual design in this study that they broke it down this way. Uh, so keep those two things in mind. Uh, what is the base rate for the event? Is it low? Well, then a rise over that base rate can seem impressive when it isn't. Second, there's a confounding here. Severity of ADHD was not controlled for in the study. And by the way, that's not just something to be uh, or, or hypothetical. Uh, we know that ADHD links up with coronary risk by itself, independent of being treated with ADHD or being treated for ADHD with these drugs. ADHD alone creates an elevated risk for future coronary heart disease, as we found in my longitudinal study, as I discuss in my video on this channel on health outcomes, and as we found in other research that showed a reduced life expectancy if ADHD is not treated. And one of the risks for that life expectancy was problems with coronary heart disease. So for various reasons, people with ADHD carry an elevated risk because they smoke more, they drink more, they don't exercise as much, they eat a very high carb, fast food, Western diet, and all of these other factors that elevate risk for coronary heart disease. So just a cautionary remark there about don't take this study too seriously. Here's another reason not to take this too, study too seriously. A year ago, over in the journal JAMA Network dealing with psychiatry, there was a meta-analysis of all research in the world on cardiovascular risk associated with ADHD medications. And you know how I love meta-analyses because they take all of the studies and examine all of their data grouped together. So here's a meta-analysis from a year ago that looked at 19 studies involving over 3.9 million people around the world from six different countries and regions all collapsed into a meta-analysis. And what did they find as far as future risk for coronary or, or cardiac arrest, stroke, arrhythmias, and so on? Nothing. They found no effect of stimulant medication on increasing any of these risks. So there you have it. This is a much bigger study, a much better study, because it's a meta-analysis that involves lots of studies combined together, and it doesn't see a signal. And that tells me that there's something very peculiar about the Danish study I just discussed that was published this week that might have a confounding factor associated with it. I think that might be severity of ADHD. Okay, so we've beaten that dead horse enough. Let's move on and talk about